Hello, everyone. Welcome to Angular Insights, updates in U.S. immigration impacting founders. We are very lucky today to have Jennifer Shear, who's going to be topic, talking about a topic which has um, you know, probably gone through quite a bit of changes in the last few years. Um, this is something that's very relevant to a lot of people. Timelines may have shifted a bit, but um, you know, we, we hope that Jennifer will be able to answer all of your questions and she's, she has a great presentation ready. Um, for those who are joining us for the first time, just a quick note on how the session will run. We will have the first half will be a presentation, the second half will be Q&A discussion. We build these sessions to be very interactive and to bring the community together. So we encourage you to ask a lot of questions. To do so, simply click raise hand. Um, and then we will get to your question in the second half. Um, Gil, how's everything going? Things are good. I, I am in the office for the first time and God knows when because there's someone in our in our house that is like fixing our heating. So wow. there's a lot of background noise. Well, how is it back being in the office? I feel like I am legend. It's, it's <laughs> insane. There's no one visible for any, any direction. <laughs> I'm, I'm in a glass box and nobody's around. Uh, Jen, are you in an office or are you at home? coming to you from an undisclosed location less than one kilometer from my home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually at the office. Um, despite the lockdown, there are uh, kind of a couple of loopholes and uh, allowing me to be in the office, thankfully. Otherwise, you might see a little kitten on my shoulder, which would be kind of distracting. <laughs> Right, cool. Um, yeah, so, so maybe just by, by way of introduction, um, you know, when I was setting up the fund, you know, we, we did two things. We decided to have this advisory partner program where we bring in um, expert people such as Jennifer into our partnership and, and sort of leverage them to help our portfolio companies. Um, and, and we also focused on helping companies move to the U.S. as a big part of our of, uh, of, of what, what, what sets us apart. Um, that's part of why um, Anne is based in New York. Um, it's part of why Jennifer was such an important part of that overall picture. Um, I still think we're probably the only fund that I'm aware of that has a dedicated uh, immigration or US immigration specialist on staff. Um, so we're absolutely thrilled to have you. Um, Jen is an American uh, based in Israel, um, has been doing immigration law uh, for 15 years, has worked with basically every single one of the top Israeli startups and, and, and as well as companies all over the world, um, helping them bring uh, employees and relocate them to the US in an in a, in a efficient and timely way. Um, when I introduce her to founders, I basically just say the truth, which is that she's never failed me or anyone I'm aware of on getting people their US visas. Um, so she's an amazing resource to have and we're absolutely thrilled uh, to have her um, with us. Um, the other thing that's sort of changed, and maybe this is a good segue into your talk, Jen, is that uh, we've always talked in Angular, positioned Angular as like we're a global fund for global companies and our imagery is all about flights and airlines and you're getting to new cities and you're opening new offices and you're crossing oceans and no one's doing this right now um, and no one has done this. And I, I have this sort of debate with people about should we change? Should, should I make, maybe we should change from an image of an airplane wing to a mask, but I, I think we're gonna keep the, the aspirational concept of it is possible to, to build a global business um, and it certainly will, will be possible again. Um, but one of the things I think you're going to talk about is, is what does the current environment mean for, for U.S. relocation? Um, and maybe with that as an intro, we'd love to sort of launch into your talk and then uh, please, just as another reminder, please click the raise hand button to ask Jennifer a question. Otherwise, you have to listen to me and Anne ask her questions, which is a lot less exciting. Gil, thanks a lot. Um... Just uh, before I get started, before we jump into to the exciting topics, I just wanted to say, as, as, you know, as grim as things have been looking, um, it is possible still to relocate to the United States and to open your, open your company there and send key employees there. Certainly founders are able to get there. It's just become more difficult. Um, I think that you know, over you know, the past six months, certainly since COVID began, um, there have been a lot of restrictions and people have been discouraged from moving forward with their relocations. And there are, are, are several obstacles uh, in the path. Um, it's kind of like uh, that Dungeons and Dragons game where you know you go and, and one door opens and then that gate drops down and then you turn right and then you know another gate drops down. But we, we have the key, we have the keys. Um, so that's really the, the topic of, of, of um, this webinar today. Um, the obstacles that founders are facing and what the possible solutions are given the current environment. Now, again, just to stress, uh, we're talking about things are changing from minute to minute in the world of US immigration. 
um, as you've read in the news, uh, people have seen it, um, have people have experienced it, you know, you know, uh, uh, personally, um, they're always constantly changing. So everything that we're discussing today is valid as of today and correct as of today. But if in the future, you know, in a few months from now, or even next week, um, things might might change again. So always um, take things with a grain of salt um, and ask about specific cases in real time. Okay, I'm gonna click forward. Okay, so these are gonna be our, our main topics today. These are the five insights. Um, I'm gonna just sort of jump right into them. I just wanna start off with some, some basic trends and updates that we've seen since um, COVID-19 started. Uh, then we're gonna dive into the main obstacles for founders, which are the executive orders that we'll talk about, the certain exceptions uh, to get around these executive orders. Practically speaking, really, how do I get to the, how do I do it? Um, and then a few, a few words, a few fun words about business trips and, and renewing your visa and travel on ESTA under the, the visa waiver program. Okay, so we've seen a pretty steep decrease in generally in relocations for, for tech companies um, since, since COVID began. So we're talking about March, 2020, that's when things kind of uh, shut down. A lot of it is due to uncertainty, um, just general uncertainty. Will I have to quarantine uh, when, I, when I leave my, my home country and uh, arrive to the United States? Um, you know, what, what, what's gonna happen? And then on top of that, and as things developed, um, the obstacles started to come. Travel bans and visa bans, things that restrict us, basically why we're not, we're not able to get to the US. There are three things that are keeping founders from getting there. It's the closure of the US embassies. So US embassies worldwide, have been closed for routine visa services since March, 2020. So even if um, you know, you're not subject to any of these visa or travel bans that we're talking about, you still might not be able to get to the United States because the embassies are closed. Um, you know, and then now, um, in, as of July, uh, the Department of State has started to reopen the US embassies and the reopening of each US embassy is actually dependent on the COVID infection rates in each country. So for example, right now in Israel, um, things are not looking good. Uh, the US Embassy announced today that they canceled all visa inter interviews in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv through the end of uh, October, you know, this October. So all, er everything's canceled. Um, it's a big, huge problem because, you know, basically you just, you can't get an interview and unless you qualify for an emergency or an exception, which we're gonna talk about at length in this, uh, in this presentation, uh, you're, you know, you can't get your visa to go to the United States. Um, things in London, just as an example, are also not looking very good. So Tel Aviv is actually looking pretty good compared to London. Right now, if you were to go into the embassy system in London and try and schedule an interview, you would get a date for August 2021 or after. So that's pretty far off. That kind of makes things difficult to, to plan that's, around. That's just for the interview? Just for the interview. So what so, would that mean in terms of getting to the U.S.? No interview it means no visa, okay? So in this, later on in our presentation, just actually in the next slide, we're going to talk about um, the different exceptions. Basically, how do I get an interview despite the fact that the embassies are closed um, and despite the fact that I may be subject to a travel or a visa ban, okay? So this can be particularly complicated. I mean, we had a case for actually an, an employee of an Angular portfolio company who found themselves subject to both, the tr based in London, both the travel and the visa ban. So this person unfortunately doesn't qualify for an exception and is going to have to wait for a year to get an interview. And that's only if these visa, the visa ban is no longer in effect at that time. So precarious situations, very difficult, requires a serious amount of creativity and, and navigation. Um, to, get in, to get your foot in the door um, the U.S. Embassy. And I just want to emphasize um, procedures and they're post by post specific. So um, the fact that Tel Aviv is canceled through October and London is, is canceled through, um, through the end of you know, August 2021, that doesn't mean that things will be the same at other uh, U.S. Embassies around the world. So you need to check uh, post, post specific um, timelines. Um, the good news is, the good news is that the U.S. Immigration Authority, USCIS, is still accepting and processing petitions. So that means we are allowed to prepare and submit petitions for work visas. 
all the different kinds, even the ones that are subject to um, the visa ban. Um, but the problem occurs, then we're back to the closure of the US embassy. So if you've submitted a petition, you have the approval, which is really the substantive part of the process, you might still not be able to process that visa due to either the closure of the embassy or because you're subject to um, you know, travel or, or entry restrictions. We'll get into that just in, in just a moment. Another trend that we're seeing um, amongst tech companies is a major increase in employment-based green cards for, for founders and employees that are already in the US. So that means that if you're you know, in the US on a whatever work, work visa, you've been there for a while, you're on, on a visa that allows you to change status from visa holder to employment-based green card holder, um, we're seeing a lot more people, I guess probably due to the uncertainty and you know, you've been in the US for a while, your family is there, you're working there, your company is there, you don't wanna leave. There's uncertainty with the visas, so many employers are submitting employment-based green card petitions uh, to keep uh, their employees, their founders, their key people in the US. Um, an update right here is that all of the employment-based green card categories are actually current for the month of October. So right now at the office, we're seeing like an onslaught of these type of petitions. Um, so that's, uh, that's just something to think about for, for longer term planning uh, for people that are already in the US. Um, good options and it's a good time to think about that now. now this is last bullet point is hot off the press. Um, USCIS filing fees for basically every type of immigration benefit under a final rule were set to increase as of October 2nd, 2020. I woke up this morning to open the news that there's been a temporary injunction um, stopping USCIS from impl implementing these major fee increases. When the fee increases were about a weighted average of about 20%, but just to throw out a couple of examples, um, an L1 visa, which is for intra-company uh, transferees, which is very popular with tech companies. The filing fee was set to increase from $460 to $805. Uh, the O1 visa fee, for example, um, from $460 to $705. These are significant increases, and they're probably um, just more reasons to deter founders from, from setting up shop in the US. So for right now, there's a freeze on that. Um, from my experience, even these temporary injunctions really are temporary and, you know, they might just snap back at, at any given time without notice. So for now, they're not in effect, but they could be soon again. Okay, so the travel and visa bans, and I'm calling them not by their, um, their proper names, simply because it's a lot of numbers and it, you won't remember the numbers and it'll probably put you to sleep and get you confused. These are very, very complicated issues, but they're the, they're the real, really what's stopping people from getting to the United States. Okay, so I'm focusing on the, the two that uh, specifically relate to um, founders. Uh, the travel ban relates to founders uh, in certain countries where entry is restricted to the United States, and the visa ban applies to, to everyone, okay? So we'll start with the travel bans. Um, President Trump issued several presidential proclamations or executive orders back um, starting in January, um, January through March 2020. We're just going to call them the, the travel bans because there were several of them. Um, and pretty much it just it restricted entry to the U.S. from people coming from certain countries. And, and the backdrop of all of this, are, of, of, of this particular executive order, is based on public health and economic uh, considerations that relate to the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Travel was suspended to the U.S. for any foreign national so that's an immigrant and we're non-immigrant uh, visa holder um, who's been physically present in the Schengen area. Okay, so that's a group of countries in Europe. I'm not going to list them all because there are a bunch of them. Um, the U.K., Ireland, China, and Brazil um, within the immediate 14 days uh, preceding their entry arrival to the U.S. So that means if you've been in any of these areas 14 days before you seek to enter the United States, you're barred, you're barred from entering the United States, okay? So that's, that's, that's pretty major. That affected you know, uh, business travel, it affected relocations, it's affecting everything. And this is an effect um, until further notice. There's, there's really no end date on this. Um, so this is, this is the travel ban. In June it's, 2020. This, 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 sure. this might be a dumb question, but if, if you really wanted to get into the US and you were not a US national, is there some kind of like, can you go to Canada and hang out there for two weeks and then come in? Like, is there some kind not of- Not a dumb question it? at all. Not a dumb question at all. 
Um, that's absolutely correct. Yes, if you have a valid uh, visa or valid estimate, something we're going to address later also, and you have not been uh, in in those areas, you can enter the U.S. Okay, so just if you've been physically present in those places 14 days prior, can't get in. Okay, it's a good question, Gilly. Uh, are you seeing a uh, strategy of choice for Israeli founders that need to do a meeting in, in the U.S.? Is anyone even doing this, or is it just theoretical? Like, are they flying to? Oh, Bermuda? you mean you know? Like, is, is anyone doing this? Has anyone actually done this kind of go through Toronto or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it it's it's a workaround. I mean, it's not as common because think about it. If you live in you know, and you, you live in London with your family. Are you gonna, are you really like you? Let's talk, take you. Is your wife gonna <laughs> let you go hang out somewhere for, you know, a couple of weeks before, you know, you went to the US, assuming you were not a US citizen, of course. It, it, but, it depends. Um, if it was Bermuda, maybe, right? Like, I'm just trying to figure out, like, are, are there easy strategies that people are using? Like, I, I guess my question is, have you seen anybody do this? Have you seen anybody I have, do it? I have seen people do it, but actually, it's, it's pretty rare because it's just logistically a nightmare and very inconvenient for people. I mean, you're literally having to, to go somewhere else and, and hang out there. And then, then of course, th that particular country that you're going to might have its own quarantine rules um, and restrictions right. on entry. So it becomes a real complicated matrix. Um, I haven't seen that much of, I, of this particular strategy. I'm assuming there's, there's no sense on when these bans might be lifted. Not this, the travel ban, no. The travel ban is until is basically until further notice. Okay, there is an end date on the next on the next uh, ban that we're going to talk about. Now, in June 2020, Trump issued this a proclamation, and this one really, really gets my goat. Okay, really, it's 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 really, really, really had such a, a hard impact on the tech industry because it affects um, the most popular visas, the visa types that that tech founders and you know and, and employees and engineers are eligible for. So. It basically restricted entry to anyone who presents a risk to the US labor market. So the visa ban suspended issuance of pretty much any new L1B, H1B, H2B, and J1 visas to the United States. Now L1 and H1B, we're not gonna talk about, we're not gonna focus on the H2B and the J1 visas here in this uh, presentation. We're gonna focus specifically on the, the L1 and H1B, but you know, as you mentioned in, a, in your very lovely intro of me is that I've been working with tech companies for, you know, 15 plus years. I've personally witnessed that when a company opens up a subsidiary in the United States, they are immediately contributing to the U.S. labor market. They're opening up on day one. They maybe send one or two of their top executives there, uh, the CEO and the CTO, and they have a hiring plan. And within no time whatsoever, um, they've already hired tons of U.S. Uh, U.S. citizens, transferred knowledge, and so on and so forth. So I don't really see. I personally, this is my own own personal opinion. The correlation between these folks, um, the highly skilled, and and a risk to the to the labor market. I I kind of have this this um, expression that I use sometimes, like my clients don't take jobs, they make jobs. Okay, but this was this was a, a real hard hit. Um, so basically. Here's a, an example of a, of a scenario. Um, you want to apply for an, we, we can, as I mentioned at the beginning, my general update, we can still submit an L1 petition or an H1B petition to USCIS and they will approve that substantive part of the employment. But in order to get the actual visa, which is your, you know, um, carte blanche into the United States, um, you might not be able to get that under most circumstances. And in a minute, we'll talk about the exceptions. So, I mean, that's, it's kind of like go no go and it's the direct reason why we're seeing uh so few relocations um since this whole thing started uh back in march so did you um, say there was a timeline where this ends yes yes this is in effect this particular executive order is in effect until december 31st 2020 until the end of the year now bill and i were chatting earlier and um and he asked me you know a, a, a question like will the elections affect this visa ban or not? And I, I believe the answer is yes, because this visa ban could be extended, okay? And it's very, it's pretty easy to extend this because the backdrop of this is, you know, there's big, there's great, you know, uh, unemployment in the United States. We're not gonna let in these foreigners because these foreigner, foreigners under some warped reasoning in their minds um, are taking jobs from, from US workers, okay? so. If, God forbid, Trump gets reelected, 
he may well decide to to extend this visa ban, which um, crossing fingers that neither of these things happen, but yes, uh, until the end of the year at least. Now, each of each of these uh, presidential proclamations includes exceptions for any, and I'm not going to say alien because I hate that word. My clients are definitely not aliens. This needs to, it's an antiquated term, but anyone, any individual whose entry would be in the national interest um, of the United States may, be, may qualify for an exception to the traveler visa ban. Okay, so let's start with um, the travel ban, okay? So anyone who has a valid visa, okay, or a valid ESTA authorization. ESTA is the authorization um, that people under the visa waiver program countries um, get in order to enter the U.S. Uh, without, a, without a visa. Um, so any, anyone who has a valid visa or valid ESTA authorization that was issued prior to the effective date um, of these presidential proclamations or want to apply for a visa, and they think that they might qualify for a national interest exception, the process is just to contact um, your U.S. Embassy or consulate before you travel. Now, each U.S. Embassy has its own list of questions and, and requirements. There are um, general bullet points that we're going to go over in a minute of examples of people who may qualify for a, a national interest exception, but you really are urged to contact the consulate um, in advance. I mean, the, some embassies are closed altogether and have not reopened, so something to, to bear in mind. So um, this is a non-exhaustive list. It's really non-exhaustive. I've just really um, handpicked out um, some examples of, of visa applicants who may qualify for a national interest exception to this travel ban um, and, and some examples of, of things that could work. So public, public health grounds. So if you're going uh, to the United States and you're doing something that has to do with, with um, public health, that's important public health matter. Obviously COVID-19 and COVID research are at the top of the list. Um, of, of um, things that would get you to qualify for this NIE, um, but, not, but it's not limited to, um, or any other area with a substantial um, public health benefit, it could be cancer or other disease research, um, this might qualify you for um, an NIE to the, to the travel ban. Uh, an example would be R&D teams of a biotech or a medical device company. Perhaps they're developing something that um, relates to um, COVID-19 um, or another disease, developing a medical device and so on and so forth. So that's just a, a quick example. Um, investors, okay, so anyone investing in the United States that generates a substantial economic impact. Now, this is, this is actually very applicable to e-visa holders, people that are on E1, um, that are seeking to apply for an E1 treaty trader visa or, or an E2 investor visa. Um, they might qualify under, under this exception um, specifically if they are senior level. So if they're CEOs or just other top level um, executives of, of the company um, that are able to provide strategic direction or lend their expertise to the success of the investment uh, may qualify for this particular exception. So uh, just a quick, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna ask, uh, uh, yeah, that question I've got to ask you, but it, you probably can't answer it, but try. Like this NIE sounds like it's, there's a judgment call involved, right? And do you, right? Is, is this, are, is your experience, I don't know how to ask this, no way you can answer, like is, is your experience that you can kind of wiggle through and find a checker that will be sympathetic or is it like, yes. is, has Trump been effective in shutting this down? Okay, that, that's an excellent question, Gil. Um, first of all, it is, um, these NIEs are open to broad discretion by consular officers, like very, very broad. And these few examples, as I mentioned before, and I'm like really emphasizing it and just because you can't fit everyone into one of these. Um, these are the ones that are specific for tech founders. And in addition to that, if you have a compelling case, so if it, let's say you go through the list of, of NIEs and you're like, I, none of these work for me. I can't get into any of them. Consular officers do have um, discretion in deciding whether a certain case qualifies for substantial economic benefit. Um, so, so, you know, it's not a closed list. So that, that's the good news. So, you know, you're welcome to present a, a compelling case. And if, and if it is compelling enough, the visa will get approved, notwithstanding this particular list. And can you give us an anonymized example of a stretch that did get approved? Yeah, um, 
I can give you something like that. Okay, so this was a real stretch. It's a stretch stretch. Okay, so we had um, a founder of, uh, of a cybersecurity company. Um, they were developing something, can't give too many details here, but developing something related to COVID research, okay? So the founder was in the US on an O-1 visa. That's for a popular type of, of visa for founders of extraordinary ability in their field. And he really is extraordinary ability. And he got married uh, to, to an Israeli uh, woman subsequent to being in the US on his, o, on his O-1 visa. So later on, right, they had to get married and their marriage itself was pretty, uh, was pretty complicated. They had to figure out country-wise how, where exactly they got married. They ended up getting married and she was stuck uh, here in Tel Aviv, not able to process her O3 visa, which is the dependent visa for, for O1. So he's in the United States, she's here, she's entitled to dependent status. O1 visas are not subject to the visa ban, okay? She's not subject to, to uh, a, a travel ban either. Um, so we basically made the case of this company um, is involved in one of these areas um, that is doing something important and the spouses should be able to be together. So that was a, that was a pretty big stretch, <laughs> but it worked at the end of the day. Okay, it, it worked at the end of the day. So again, not, not a closed list. Um, so, okay, yeah, so trade with major US corporations might get you there if you're an investor. Um, you know, if your company is doing, you know, a lot of business together with one of the big ones. I just threw out Intel or Microsoft, but it could be any big company. Um, or government agencies, U.S. government agencies and municipalities um, could could also work. Uh, economic economic uh, grounds. So again, substantial economic benefit to the U.S. is the name of the game here. So if you're a senior manager, you're providing, you're the one who's running the show uh, in the United States or or the venture, um, that, and you can show that that what you're doing has a direct economic benefit to the U.S. Like for example, you have a large workforce. You've got large scale, large scale projects going on in the United States, um, JVs with U.S. corporations. This might this might qualify. Um, a general uh, NIE for the travel ban is immediate relatives of U.S. citizens and green card holders. That's pretty much an easy one. It's kind of a technical one, and there's not there's not a lot of uh, wiggle room on on the side of the U.S. embassy to say whether this works or not. It's like if you're married to one, it works, okay? And actually, you, you can actually, and I'm not recommending that this be done by any means, I'm just throwing out there, um, that you can actually apply for this particular national interest exception directly at Customs and Border Protection. So that's, you know, upon arrival to the United States by bringing a copy of the marriage certificate to, to the US citizen or the green card holder, uh, legal permanent resident, and you most likely will be granted entry based on that. Again, it's kind of, not recommended on the one hand simply because it, it, it has worked it certainly has but i don't like sending people on 10 11 hour flights without knowing for sure that they're getting in or at least a reasonable um uh, uh a reasonable possibility that they will and not have any trouble okay um national interest exceptions to the visa ban now Again, this visa ban is absolutely evil. Like I just don't understand how they could how they could say that, you know, these folks are hurting the U.S. economy. But it is what it is, so we have to deal with it. Um, we're doing a lot of NIEs uh, for for this particular visa ban. Luckily, our clients are doing things that are important to the national interest of the United States. Um, it took effect on June 24, 2020, and suspended issuance of most new L1, H1, and other types of visas through the end of the year. So I chose because the L1 intercompany visa and the H1B specialty occupation visa are very, very popular um, amongst tech companies. Uh, again, not an exhaustive list and just a few examples of things that work. So the first example is exactly the same as the first example. Um, and I'm just gonna skip over it because it's the same as the first example from the travel ban, uh, public health related. Um, this, the second bullet um, might actually apply to companies, tech companies that are dealing with, let's say, um, defense uh, in the defense area. So it's based on a request from a U.S. government agency to meet a critical policy objective or, or satisfy treaty or contractual um, obligations. So supporting it, something that has to do with um, a product that supports U.S. military-based construction or IT infrastructure or things along those lines. Um, probably less relevant, but could, could be. 
Now this one is one that we do the most of this particular NIE. So this is um, an, a person who is returning to the United States to resume employment in the same position with the same employer and the same visa classification. So if we have a CEO that wants to renew his, his L visa, okay, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, as long as you're going back, there hasn't been any changes, um, you should qualify under this particular exception. Um, and just a very, very, very quick uh, word on L1A applicants. L1A, by way of background, quickly, I know we've maybe mentioned a little bit earlier, intra-company transferees, multinational managers and executives. Um, if you're going to um, be a senior level executive and serve a critical business need for a, an employer that meets a critical infrastructure need. Now, there's a lot, a lot of room for, for interpretation here on this. Anakana, you can see on, on the screen um, the areas um, the examples of what critical infrastructure means. So there's tons of interpretation here. Um, very, very doable in terms of uh, this particular NIE. Okay, so how do I get to the US Gen? Blah, 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 lots of technical stuff. How do I actually get there? So the first step is, am I subject to one or both of, of the presidential proclamations? Some people think, automatically they, they see L1 and I'm on an L1 and I'm definitely, um, they definitely apply to me and I am subject to one of these proclamations. You may not necessarily be, you might, you might be exempt altogether, okay? Just not subject to, okay? So this is the first question. Um, and once you make that determination, if you are subject to one or both of them, then the next question is, do I qualify for an exception based on either national interest um, or, or substantial economic benefit if we're talking about one of the types of visas that is, that is not subject to either to the, the proclamation, uh, the visa ban proclamation. Okay, so a B visa, for example, or other, other types of visas. The process is pretty straightforward um, for applying for an NIE. You need to build your NIE case in advance. And the reason I say build it in advance and be sure of it is because once you request the emergency appointment at the embassy. Okay, you're gonna schedule a visa interview via the, the embassy's regular appointment system. So in London, you're gonna be like, all right, I'm scheduling an interview for September 2021, and you're, you know, okay. Um, and within their scheduling system, most of the scheduling systems are, are fairly similar. Uh, there's a button in there for request emergency visa appointment. Once you do that, you'll be, a window will open up and you'll be prompted to kind of make a mini case there of why you think you qualify for a national interest exception. So you need to get your paperwork ready in advance because if you are approved for a, an emergency appointment, it might actually be from one day to the next. So we had, we had someone, a founder that was in the US, also uh, an L1 holder, marriage subsequent uh, to being in the US, spouse needed to process the visa, and uh, he did this himself without consulting with us. We only found out about it afterwards you know, they were in the U.S. and she was there on a B visa and they scheduled her, her interview for tomorrow. So obviously she can't get from the United States to Israel tomorrow. And when she does get to Israel tomorrow, she's going to be subject to 14 days of quarantine per Israel's um, quarantine restrictions, lockdown restrictions. So that, that doesn't work. So when you build your case, make sure you have all of your documentation ready, be ready with examples of contracts, um, you know, POs with clients, anything else that supports your case because you might find yourself at the embassy tomorrow. Um, once you get to the appointment, if it's approved, you present your case to the consular officer and they decide on the spot whether or not to grant you the visa. If the visa is issued, it will have an annotation on it, um, specifically saying um, which, which NIE you qualify for so that you won't have trouble getting into the United States. And as I mentioned earlier, broad discretion in adjudicating the NIEs. Um, so if you have a compelling case that we didn't talk about today, uh, please feel free to be in touch, um, you know, to assess the eligibility for that. Last but not least, uh, just some general, some general stuff here about business trips, uh, visa renewals, and ESTA entry to the U.S. under the Visa Waiver Program. Um, First time B visa application. So B visa is a, is a tourist visa. It's usually a B1, B2 visa, which allows entry for business, uh, business or pleasure in the United States. It's what tech companies use for, you know, uh, Israelis who don't qualify under the visa waiver program have to have B visas. They don't have the luxury of, of entering the US uh, without one. Um, 
so if it's your first time B visa applicant, which is the likelihood with tech founders is pretty low, but if it's your first time application, uh, the US Embassy, at least in Tel Aviv, is entertaining emergency appointments only. Okay, so then again, back to showing substantial economic benefit um, to get the appointment or an emergency could also be a, a humanitarian ground or a medical reason, basically a life or, life or death situation that would also uh, get you an appointment. Um, quick update about visa application fees. So you've paid the visa fee, which could be you know $160 or $190, depending on the visa category, $200 or more. And generally, those are valid for one year. Um, now, because of the situation that your, your interview might be in more than a year from now, um, they'll be valid for more than one year. So that's good news, and you don't lose the money. Um, this third point, I want to make a clarification here on this, um, interview waivers. So people that are renewing their visas may actually qualify for a waiver of the interview. So that means that they can send in their passport. You have to meet certain eligibility criteria, which I'm not going to list out right now. But if you do meet those criteria, you can just send your passport into uh, the US Embassy and they will process the visa and send it back to you by courier. I write Israelis only, but it's not, it's actually just Israelis. It's Israelis or anyone who isn't subject to the, to the travel ban, okay? So um, in, in, in Israel, if you're renewing a B visa and you meet the criteria, you can just send it in. This will not work for the UK and Schengen tra travel bans. They don't have the interview, um, waiver program is not available. So if you look at the US Embassy website um, in London, you'll see that that's just not gonna work. Um, of course, it's because of the, of the proclamations. If you wanna just travel to the US on a valid B visa on ESTA, you can, but only if you're not subject to one of the, the proclamation. Um, I think it's, a, it's, it's pretty obvious, but I just wanted to say that anyway, because I get this, everyone, people ask me this all the time. Um, Satisfactory departure is really, really, really important for people who entered on the visa waiver program and they get stuck in the United States due to COVID. So the visa waiver program allows uh, people to enter the US for up to 90 days. You can't extend ESTA in the US. It's a kind of a luxury. You, you know, you, we're gonna, on the one hand, you can enter without a visa. On the other hand, you can only stay for 90 days. So we've seen a ton of situations where people's flight were, flights were canceled. There were entry restrictions coming back. They got stuck there and you don't want to overstay those 90 days on ESTA because if you do, you're never going to be able to use ESTA again. Okay, so this is really, really, really an important thing. So there's this super simple, easy, easy procedure for extending ESTA if you get stuck in the US due to COVID. And of course, it's specifically due to COVID and you're gonna have to um, possibly give documentation of such to show that that's the reason why you're stuck there. Uh, where you call up CBP, Customs Border Protection, um, and you tell them the situation. And basically, through a, a process called satisfactory departure, they extend your stay in increments of 30 days. So this is really, really, really important, and it's fairly simple to do. You, you, you don't need a lawyer to do it. You just you just call up. Like in JFK, they're, they're very, very entertaining of these requests. Um, I would just say that um, you can't abuse this. You know, it's for 30 days. You might get it for another 30 days. But it's not like I'm staying forever in the US on ESTA because of COVID. Eventually, you're going to have to get out. So that's my, that's my spiel for today. Uh, any that's... specific questions you may have? I know it's a lot. And it's uh, it's kind of heavy technical stuff. So again, just a reminder, follow-up questions are, are welcome uh, here or, or afterwards separately by email. So first of all, Jen, thank you so much. And let, let me again remind, you know, people who are on the call, I, I, I can see who's on the call and I know a lot of them are planning on moving to the US. So I, I, you should be asking questions, it's a great opportunity. So let me encourage you again to click click the raise hand button. Um, I just wanna change gears, Jen, ask you a sort of a, a future prognostication question and a businessy question. Um, the future question is um, uh, like, like you and probably like most people on this call, I, I pray several times a day that Trump loses the election. Um, if he does lose the election, and I, I realize you can't make these kinds of predictions, but how do you expect to see this start to change, you know, come January when the civil war is over and he's sworn in, what would happen? How, how do you think this will change? Like how, how in, in the best case, what does it start to look like in February, if, March? Okay, so this is if Trump does not win the election. If Trump does not win the election. Right, okay, well, Biden has, um, 
you know, sworn to uh, put things back to a normal state of affairs uh, when, it, when it comes to, to immigration. So I expect that, um, as I mentioned earlier, if Trump does get reelected, the, the, visa, the visa ban is going to probably be extended, okay? So I could expect that as of the end of the year, it's going to, it, you know, it's, if he doesn't get reelected, it's, it's going to stop, which is, which is huge because it's affecting the, you know, the economy and, and the world, you know? So I think that that's, um, that's definitely on the horizon. And I think that like just over the past, you know, since this is not even COVID related, this is something that's related to just this particular administration. It's been anti-immigrant um, completely and totally. And I think that there's been a lack of um, differentiation between the different types of immigrants and their particular contributions to the United States, okay? So um, back when Obama was on, there were different uh, initiatives that were starting to become introduced that would um, make it easier for highly skilled people, uh, tech companies, companies that are investing in the United States, that are creating jobs and truly you know, contributing to the economy uh, to, to encourage them and make it easier for them to get there and to do that um, and not kind of um, group everyone, all immigrants into, into, into one box. Okay, because our folks, as I said, they don't take jobs, they make jobs. So I would expect that things uh, would change considerably uh, in, in, in our favor if Trump does not get reelected, because it's just literally been at the top of his agenda since he got into office. It's been one, at, one hit after the other, um, to the point of um, just a, something that's, you know, thank God this, this didn't actually happen, but um, because of the decrease in all of the relocations, USCIS, the immigration authorities, which is which is fee funded, um, was a, they were asking Congress for a 1.2 billion dollar bailout just a couple of months ago because if there are less relocations, less filing fees, so they were about to they were about to furlough about you know 15,000 employees. Okay, so if that happened, it would have been an effective shutdown uh, of, of the U.S. of the U.S. immigration caused directly by the President of the United States. So luckily, that didn't happen. Um, but this fee increase, which I mentioned earlier in my in my presentation, was meant to sort of even things out. Uh, lucky, luckily, the the U.S. immigration lawyers are fighting so hard, um, you know, to, so that wouldn't happen. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot less, you know, rocks being thrown at us, and and making things easier. More programs like there were in the previous administration. Okay, so let's, let's be optimistic that that's the world that we, we enter into. Um, from a business perspective, um, you speak with a lot of founders and executives and chief counsels who are thinking about these issues. They're, they're facing the bans, they're facing the travel bans. Um, what are the smart companies doing in this period when I'm assuming most of them are not doing any travel at all? Most of them, are they freezing everything? Are they taking other steps to make their pathway easier, assuming that by wins, are they just changing their business plans completely so no one moves anywhere? Like, what are you sensing when you talk to executives? <clears throat> well, I'm seeing, well, okay, you have kind of different groups. I mean, nothing is going to stop, at the moment, at least, I, I, I believe that the, and, and I think we can see this like through the numerous investments, major investments in, in tech companies um, over the past year and, or six months even, um, so investors are continuing to invest. Um, the prime market seems to continue to be the United States. You're not going to stop these people from getting to the United States. So one way or the other, they're going to get there. It's just um, they're having to be more creative about it. Um, you know, things that we discussed during our, our, our presentation, my presentation earlier, um, they're still opening the subsidiaries. Um, more business trips. If they can't get their work visas, they're going on business trips and they're of course not working when they're there. They're doing things that are okay, uh, um, you know, meetings and, and uh, et cetera, or Zoom meetings, I guess. Um, and they're, they're still getting over there, but I think that they're, a lot of them are saying, a lot of said like, let's put this all on hold altogether. We'll think about relocating our key people um, more towards the end of the year when things become more clear. Um, to see whether these, you know, um, these restrictions are, are still in place. So that's one, one kind, of, kind of group. Um, we have, I'm seeing people, um, companies hiring like local consultants to run the show 
um, initially their new companies that they've established in the US until they get there. So they're seeing remote management. Um, which is which is tricky, but it, it's still being done. So they'll open the U U.S. entity and hire a few people on the ground, and then remotely manage them from there. Maybe come over on business trips until you know until then. Um, and then I see the the pre planners, I call them, and these are my favorite people because I think they're they're smart to do this. Which is okay. What can we do right now? Right now, we can still submit petitions to USCIS. Now, submitting a petition to USCIS under normal circumstances, without all these complications is a process that can take you know, several months in itself. And there can be plenty of delays in that process as well. There can be requests for evidence that are 10 pages long. And you know, it, 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 they, those take time to handle. So they're the pre-planners are, we're gonna get our petition approval right now. Even if we don't qualify for an exception, we wanna know that we've got that approval in hand. Um, and so that we can activate it, so, uh, uh, so to speak, um, you know, when, when, the time, when the time comes. So there's that. And then there's also others that are have, as I mentioned, they have people on the ground already in the US on work visas. They're, that's why we're seeing so many employment-based green cards right now. They wanna be sure that those people that they spent so much money on that were so important to the company in the US are able to remain there permanently. Awesome, thank you. So we got a question from Sarah and she was asking, um, she would love to hear more about renewals. What has the turnaround time been for, for them? Well, that really depends, um, Sarah. I'm, are, where are you from, Sarah? Are you are you coming to us from from Israel? Um, she typed it in. I so I can okay. find out. Okay. All right. Yeah. So okay. So um, then I'll give you a kind of uh, I'll give you the, the kind of a little generic a answer, which is you're going to have to check the U.S. Embassy website for the specific consulate where you're applying. You know, for for the renewal in. So if you're going getting uh, submitting um, a renewal visa, the interview waiver uh, program um, in Tel Aviv, uh, the processing time is about two to three weeks. Awesome, thank you. And so I have a question. You touched a little bit on um, employment-based green cards. So you're saying that founders who are already in the US, a lot of them are trying to get this because there's so much uncertainty. Yeah. How mm -hmm. difficult is it to get it for, for a founder that's already here? Is it pretty much guaranteed if you've been here on a visa or is it still really complicated? And okay. So, it's, like how long does it take? Okay. So it's, it's a long process and there are several employment based visa, um, employment based visa categories. Okay. So just for the sake, cause we don't have a lot of time. I'll just use the one that's, um, it's kind of like the parallel to the L1 visa. So you're a multinational manager executive. You, before you got to the U S on your L visa, you worked in, at the U S at the uh, foreign entity for 12 months managerial executive capacity uh, and then you're asking for they're asking to employ permanently in the US also in a managerial capacity um, it's taking anywhere from I'd say at least 12 to 16 months plus uh, to get the the EB1 green card as of right now processing times are always subject to change um, and the substantive part is is you know it's complicated you need to prove eligibility um, the other categories for employment-based green cards are going to take longer because there is a process, um, a labor certification process, where the U.S. entity basically needs to show that no U.S. employees can take that job. So it's going to be even maybe six months beyond that. Okay, um, and getting your actual green card will depend on uh, the availability of, um, we'll call it a an immigrant, a green card number, just to make it easy. Um, once your petition is adjudicated and your application is approved. Awesome, thank you. So we're now joined by Curtis. Um, Curtis, you have the floor. Uh, just a quick question, Jen, um, Jennifer, sorry. Canada, like this is very Israeli focused and, and one of our, one of um, Gil's investments is now in Canada and we are looking to, for our CEO to have some sort of visa to get there and I'm driving one of your colleagues completely crazy and trying to I, I, yeah Curtis I think we know each other <laughs> <laughs> you know how I difficult I, I am can be on this but can is Canada my, our delay is obviously on my side in getting the right information but just generally is Canada a bit easier than what you've described here because Canada is good to go, actually. Okay, Canada okay. is good to go because they're actually exempt from the visa from the the visa ban. So that's like yeah. really, 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 yeah, yeah. So that's really, really good news. Okay. 
yeah, it's just, it's my issue with Desi. She's probably wants to kill me by now, but just. <laughs> no, no, no. And I've been following it. Yeah, that's, no, no, no. We're good. We're, we're going to get her there. We're going to get okay. her there. Yeah, everything's much easier you. for Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Curtis, for asking your question. So we got a question from Delia, and she was asking, um, what happens if you are on an L1 in the U.S. and you are furloughed? So I'm sure some people might okay, be in the situation. Okay, yeah. Dahlia. Hi, Dahlia. Hi. <laughs> I know Dahlia, too. Thanks for asking that question. Dahlia, I promise I will, I will answer that question. It's a little bit beyond the scope of, and it's a little bit too long of an answer um, for this particular forum, but give me a call and I will get you the answer to that. What's, what's the short version? Uh, it, it's complicated. I really, I don't want to, okay. I don't want to get in there. I'll put it this way. You need to comply with the terms uh, and conditions of your, of your visa. That's the short answer. Okay. So, you know, that means I'm still working where I should be working in the United States. Okay. So if you're no longer employed, again, I really, really don't want to get into this one specifically because it's just, it's a bit too, it's a bit too, it's a bit too much, but we'll address, I will address it separately. Cool. I've got one one question. Um, you know, uh, what would you say is the, the biggest mistake you know that startups make? You know, we 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 try to encourage our founders to talk to you as early as possible in their process, even before they've figured out. Let, let's assume you know we're in normal times, no coronavirus, no Trump. But you know, we encourage founders to talk to you as early as possible so they avoid some mistakes and missteps. Um, when you end up meeting with teams that are meeting you too late and have made a bunch of mistakes. What's the most common mistake that they make? If there's anything that you can sort of give founders to sort of take away, hey, make sure you don't do X. What's what's that one thing? Um, not speaking to us. Exactly what you mentioned when you first started, what you were saying, and it's not speaking to us early enough, okay? Because um, uh, strong financial viability is required to support visa processes to the United States. Um, so founders uh, typically show up you know, only after they've gotten their funding, yet they don't know, there were things that they could have done because they assume that like, oh, well, I, I didn't get funding and I, and I, you know, I'm not, there's no way I'm going to get a, a visa a petition approval right now under these circumstances, no money in the bank. Um, so they, they don't come, they come to us at a later stage where they needed the advice earlier so that we could help them lay the groundwork for a successful visa petition. Okay. So it's, 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 it's waiting too long basically and then they've waited too long and then they want to get there tomorrow and we can't help them because they haven't done things that needed to be done like a year ago okay so for example if you know if you want an l1 visa you need to have been on the payroll for 12 consecutive months full-time and continuous prior to being able to submit this particular petition right so if you weren't on the payroll for whatever reason not take you know you might not qualify for an l and that's not something that you can if you want to get there tomorrow, you're going to have to wait another 12 months from now. So I'd say that's, that's one of the biggest mistakes is just, you know, not um, getting in touch with counsel early enough. And I'm very happy personally to talk to people when they are not ready to support the visa process because we help them, we give them the tools. And then I know that a 30 minute conversation is going to result in them coming back to us um, in six, seven months after they got in their funding and, and, and we'll, we'll be ready for a successful petition. Awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. So I have a question. Um, so most of the founders that I've worked with who have come to the U.S., they typically get either the E2 or the L1 visa. Um, so in general, like in normal times, which one is your like recommended visa? And right now, which one? Because it seems like the, L, the E2. Okay, so if we're, if we're between the L and, and the E visa? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is an excellent question, and it's really, really tricky. Um, so it, it, it depends, okay? Now, the L visa is subject to the current visa ban, okay? The E visa is not subject to the, the visa ban, but the U.S. embassies are closed. So if, again, we're taking London and Tel Aviv as examples, okay? The Tel Aviv E visa unit is not accepting E visa applications at all right now, okay? So just to give you an idea, processing times um, before COVID went into effect uh, for, for applications, for e-visa applications, were already on about two, two and a half months. So that means you submitted a, um, a company registration, an e-company registration, um, and it took them about two months to get back to you uh, before you'd be called in for the interview. Um, so now they're not accepting them at all. So 
I don't know when the US Embassy opens up again is also a huge question mark. We have no idea at this rate in Tel Aviv, who knows when that's going to happen. So I wouldn't count on it because a these these type of applications are kind of time sensitive. The E1 is, is time sensitive. It's dependent on a certain a period of trade. Um, so if you do something now, it's just going to be sitting in my office and collecting dust. <laughs> and when they do reopen, the backlog is probably going to be so long that you're not going to want to wait and it won't be relevant anymore. Um, so I would bank more on an L1, but only specifically if you think that you might meet one of the national interest exceptions, because if you don't, then you're not going anywhere anyway. Okay, but but in general, E's are, are wonderful. They're a wonderful creature. I, I love them. Um, London, for example, is is accepting e-applications, but they're not processing processing them. So, yeah, yeah, a trade-off. But right now, I think at least with an L, you can at least submit your petition and get your approval. Awesome. Well, we are out of time, Jennifer. Thank you so much for for doing this session. This was super insightful. I learned a lot, and um, you know, we would love to do this again. When post Trump, when things have kind of stabilized and normalized, as I'm sure the recommendations will be quite different um, then. Uh, so Jennifer, thank you so much. Everyone, thank you so much for joining. We are off next week, but we will be back October 14th with Omri Tamir, who will be talking about his experience at Datarama and Czech. Um, to check out all of our upcoming sessions, go to our website. We also have all of our videos um, from all of our past sessions, including this one. We, we should have this up later today. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much and, and stay safe Thanks. and stay well. Thanks, Thank so Angel. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.